Our format tonight, as I say, will be a bit different from that of most of our previous forums. Tonight, we intend to have a conversation with a time to include you at the end with some questions and answers. Well, tonight, our conversation is with one of the better known writers in Christian circles. From his time in Oxford to London to Bristol to Birmingham to Vancouver, not in that order, our guest has been someone with a gift of clarifying issues. If it is true, as former Archbishop Michael Ramsey said, that the best defense of any doctrine is the creative exposition of it, then we have with us this evening one of the more faithful defenders of the faith in the last half century. Trained at Oxford, having served as a pastor in Birmingham, England, and having taught theology in England, Canada, and around the world, our guest's books are on topics ranging from Scripture to evangelism to God Himself. And in them he has carefully and clearly and faithfully given us some of the finest guides that many of us here tonight have known to God's truth. He is currently Professor of Systematic and Historical Theology at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. It is with profound thanks to God for the ministry that he has given our choice servant tonight that we have here. We welcome our guest tonight, J.I. Packer. Jim, it's good to have you. Good evening. <laughs> and am I coming through at the back? Apparently so. Let me put it Irish. If you can't hear me at the back, raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Clearly we can manage. Mm. Jim, the way that many of us know you, uh, obviously, is from your writings, as we do. And there are some of the more well-known things we'll come to a bit later. But I think some of the writings that, uh, writing that you did that's had the most profound effect on pastor after pastor and uh, a serious Christian after serious Christian that I meet was really uh, not a book you wrote your own, but it's one of your many introductions and prefaces. It's uh, one of your early ones, the one that you did to John Owen's book, this Puritan classic on the atonement called The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. And in it, you begin with some trenchant comments on the gospel in the evangelical world today, and so about 40 years ago. Would you mind just reading that section that you and I talked about earlier? Sure. One of the most urgent tasks facing evangelical Christendom today is the recovery of the gospel. This remark may cause some raising of eyebrows, but it seems to be warranted by the facts. There's no doubt that evangelicalism today is in a state of perplexity and unsettlement. In such matters as the practice of evangelism, the teaching of holiness, the building up of local church life, the pastors dealing with souls and the exercise of discipline, there's evidence of widespread dissatisfaction with things as they are and of equally widespread uncertainty as to the road ahead. This is a complex phenomenon to which many factors have contributed, but if we go to the root of the matter, we shall find that these perplexities are all ultimately due to our having lost our grip on the biblical gospel. Without realizing it, we have, during the past century, bartered that gospel for a substitute product, which, though it looks similar enough in points of detail, is, as a whole, a decidedly different thing. Hence our troubles. For the substitute product doesn't answer the ends for which the authentic gospel has in past days proved itself so mighty. The new gospel conspicuously fails to produce deep reverence, deep repentance, deep humility, a spirit of worship, a concern for the church. Why? We would suggest that the reason lies in its own character and content. It fails to make people God-centered in their thoughts and God-fearing in their hearts because this is not primarily what it's trying to do. One way of stating the difference between it and the old gospel is to say that it's too exclusively concerned to be helpful to man, that is, to bring peace and comfort, happiness and satisfaction, and it's too little concerned to glorify God. The old gospel was helpful too, more so indeed than is the new, but, so to speak, incidentally, for its first concern was always to give glory to God. It was always and essentially 
a proclamation of divine sovereignty in mercy and judgment, a summons to bow down and worship the mighty Lord on whom man depends for all good, both in nature and in grace. Its center of reference was unambiguously God. But in the new gospel, the center of reference is man. This is just to say that the old gospel was religious in a way that the new gospel is not. Whereas the chief aim of the old was to teach people to worship God, the concern of the new seems limited to making them feel better. The subject of the old gospel was God and his ways with men. The subject of the new is man and the help God gives him. And there's a world of difference. The whole perspective and emphasis of gospel preaching has changed. From this change of interest has sprung a change of content, for the new gospel has in effect reformulated the biblical message in the supposed interests of helpfulness. Accordingly, the themes of man's natural inability to believe, of God's free election being the ultimate cause of salvation, and of Christ dying specifically for his sheep are not preached. These doctrines, it would be said, are not helpful. They would drive sinners to despair by suggesting to them that it's not in their own power to be saved through Christ. The possibility that such despair would be salutary is not considered. It's taken for granted that it cannot be because it's so shattering to our self-esteem. The result of these omissions is that part of the biblical gospel is now preached as if it were the whole of that gospel. And a half-truth, masquerading as the whole truth, becomes a complete untruth. Right? Right. <laughs> Thus we appeal to people as if they all had the ability to receive Christ at any time. We speak of Christ's redeeming work as if he'd done no more by dying than make it possible for us to save ourselves by believing. We speak of God's love as if it were no more than a general willingness to receive any who will turn and trust. And we depict the Father and the Son not as sovereignly active in drawing sinners to themselves, but as waiting in quiet impotence at the door of our hearts, as we say, for us to let them in. It's undeniable that this is how we preach. Perhaps this is what we really believe. But it needs to be said with emphasis that this set of twisted half-truths is something other than the biblical gospel. The Bible is against us when we preach in this way, and the fact that such preaching has become almost standard practice among us only shows how urgent it is that we should review this matter. To recover the old, authentic, biblical gospel and to bring our preaching and practice back into line with it is perhaps our most pressing present need. Thank you very much. Jim, you read those lines of 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you still affirm all of that? Yes. No hesitation, no asterisks, no qualifications? No, I think it's still true. And that's why I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some things change. This hasn't changed yet. That's my observation. So I think those words are still as apropos as they were when I first wrote them. Have you seen in these last 40 years uh, those concerns that you had then being addressed in evangelicalism generally? There has emerged a minority within the evangelical world that has addressed them, yes. This minority calls itself reformed. Um, the people around and about usually refer to the, the members of this group as Calvinists. I, for one, who belong to this group, as God enables me, I don't like being called Cal a Calvinist because Calvin himself was very anxious not to make a party bearing his name or anything like it. 
and I re venerate the, mem the memory of Kelvin too much to do something which, if he knew about it, as I suppose in glory he might well, um, he would want to rebuke me for. So I use his word, reformed. The reformed people have set themselves to review the questions that I raise in that, uh, that, 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 state, that statement I read, and they have found models for their own preaching of the gospel in the 17th century Puritans and in people like George Whitfield, the pioneer at every point of the 18th century awakening, and Jonathan Edwards, who was very much helped by Whitfield into evangelistic ministry, and in Charles Spurgeon, who perhaps you know, was the greatest pastor evangelist bar none in 19th century England. And in recent years, you may know the name of Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great individual preacher of the gospel in Britain, who in his own day was thought of as the finest evangelistic preacher in the country. Well, all these men, in fact, modeled the kind of change that I was calling for in that extract. And taking their cue from these men, the reformed constituency has begun to change. I mean, to change into this older, wiser pattern. And for that, I thank God. But the reform people are still very much a minority. And the, the situation overall still needs the treatment that I was trying to spell out. And Jim, you didn't grow up yourself in a Christian family, did you? No, I didn't. Um, God knew what he was doing with me. I grew up in a church-going home, but there was a, a church-going family, I should say, but in the home, I'm afraid there was no real Christian influence at all. So the gospel, in God's good time, came to me as something new and something exciting just because I'd reached my late teens and never met it before. And how is it you came to meet it? I won't tell you the whole story, it would take too long. It begins with a Unitarian trying to persuade me that though, of course, he said, of course, Jesus Christ wasn't divine, his moral teaching was the most wonderful thing since ice cream. <laughs> there seemed to me something strange about that view, and it set me wondering what the truth of Christianity might be. C.S. Lewis comes into the story there. I read the material in Mere Christianity, which in those days was published as three small books. I read his uh, screw tape letters, and that helped me on the way. I became orthodox in the sense that I was prepared to stand up and argue for the Christian creed. But there came a time in my first term at Oxford University when I was listening to a, preach, a preaching of the gospel at an evangelistic service, and over a period of about 20 minutes, the following things happened. I became aware quite suddenly and even traumatically that my position was that of someone standing outside a house where a party was going on and looking in through the window. Yes, I could see they were, uh, they were enjoying themselves. Yes, I could understand the games they were playing. Yes, I could see the food they were eating. But I was outside, not inside. Why was I outside? Well, because I had kept Jesus Christ at bay kept him out of my life, I mean, as a living Lord. And that was what had to change. Uh, the sermon ended, the congregation sang, Just As I Am. It was a very ordinary conversion, you see. Uh, lots of people these days get converted while people are singing, Just As I Am, all around them. <laughs> and, and by the time the service ended, I was a believer, and I knew I was a believer, and Christ was my Savior and my Lord. He'd broken into my life, 
and I was going out to live a new life in him, with him. I remember writing home to my parents to tell them that that was now the agenda. It was a clear-cut conversion. And that was about 55 years ago. Nine, was it? Nine, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Ni 1944. Uh, and now that I think of it, it was in the month of October. And this might even be the anniversary. I can't tell you which day it was. But uh, 55 years, yes. Mm. That's right. Mm. I and was never good at math, you understand. But <laughs> And 55 years on of following Christ, uh, mm -hmm. you've, you've found uh, along the way some heroes, some people to help you who've been particularly useful in your following Christ? Oh, yes. Uh, I was always a bookish person, and I wasn't two years into my Christian life, probably not one year in, actually, before I had found Bishop J.C. Ryle. I wonder if you know his name. He was the first bishop of Liverpool, England. He died in 1900, so it'll be his centenary next year. He was a man who had drunk deep at the wells of the Puritans. And uh, he taught Christian faith, Christian truth, Christian wisdom, Christian life in Puritan terms and made no secret that that was where he that was the source from which he drew his understanding of the scriptures on these matters. The extract that I read was from my preface to a book by a 17th century Puritan, John Owen, and Ryle put me onto Puritans. Actually, I found Owen on my own and found him extremely enriching, clarifying, and uh, edifying in his, his treatment of questions about the Christian life. Other Puritans came in on the act, if I may put it that way. I found Richard Baxter. Uh, I found John Bunyan. I gained a great deal from them. I found John Calvin, and his institutes have meant a great deal to me over the years. I mentioned Lewis. I've read, I think, all Lewis's Christian writings and reread a lot of them and gained much from Lewis with his um, simple, childlike rationality. He insists on seeing straight and not allowing his lines of thought to be distorted or diverted by uh, any irrelevant considerations. He talks real, rational, plain, simple Bible Christianity, and he's given me a great deal by so doing. These are just some of the people. There are others. So I haven't mentioned George Whitfield as a hero, but he is. I went to George Whitfield's old school, and George Whitfield was, as I said, the pioneer of all the good things that happened in the 18th century awakening. He was the first man to preach the gospel, he was the first man to publish journals testifying to the way that God was leading and using him. He was the first man to organize what we would call small groups. In those days, they were called societies. Small groups for folk who'd come to faith, So that, uh, for small groups in which they would fellowship with each other and be led by older and wiser folk who would help them to move on together in the Lord and maintain the spiritual glow by being together. You've got to have fellowship as a young Christian if you're going to grow. And uh, in the small groups of the 18th century, that's what happened. Um, Whitfield went to America. Whitfield spread the same, g the same gospel and the same uh, revival fire, as one may properly call it, in New England, as he'd been uh, spreading in Old England. And he was doing all this years before Wesley got in on the act, three years, four years before. He was the leader. Wesley never liked to acknowledge that, it has to be said, because Wesley, after all, was 10 years older, and Wesley had been a fellow of an Oxford college, whereas Whitfield was only the son of a man who kept a tavern. But um, just his, as a matter of history, Whitfield came first. And Whitfield was one of these 
Calvinists. Clear-headed, strong, loving, expansive, beautiful Christian spirit he had. But those were his convictions. And when I found Whitfield, I, I found him, actually, of course, when I think of it, I found him before I found any of these other people. I was converted in October. In December, um, the Christmas vacation had begun and I was at home. And I found the two-volume Life of Whitfield in our local public library. I knew that, I'd been, that the school I'd been to had produced Whitfield, and people have been telling, well, but didn't you know Whitfield was an evangelist? Whitfield was a preacher of the gospel. Um, I got bronchitis, and I can remember lying in bed with bronchitis, reading the biography of George Whitfield, and getting an enormous amount of joy and encouragement from it. Yeah, but those are just some of the people. Mm. Right. What about uh, during mm. this century, Mm -hmm. people that you've met along the way. I mean, I guess you met Lewis and you heard him lecture, but that was not particularly about Christian matters. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Others who along the way may have influenced you personally? Uh, I suppose that uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones is number one in terms of living influences. He and I disagreed about some things towards the end of his ministry, but I would name him as the greatest man I ever knew. He was, I think I said earlier, uh, tagged as the premier preacher of the gospel in Britain. I heard him preach the gospel often enough to feel that that judgment must be true. I never heard anyone who brought so much of God, God's presence and God's power into the pulpit with him as Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was at his greatest, I think, when he was preaching the gospel from the gospels and bringing the Lord Jesus into it directly as himself, the teacher who said the things that pierced the heart and that shut the uh, hearers up to self-despair and the necessity of faith. And this is Matthew, this is the sayings of Jesus as recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke, as well as in John. I've never heard anyone open up the Gospels in an evangelistic way as Lloyd-Jones did. It was wonderful. You won't know the name of Alan Stibbs. He was an ex-China missionary, Anglican clergyman, teacher in a theological college, became a very close personal friend. He was a man of God, if ever there was one. And... He was, uh, in terms of his own temperament, as possessed by the gospel when he preached, and indeed when he talked at one-on-one, -on -one, as Lloyd-Jones was. Temperament entirely different. Lloyd-Jones was Welsh, and there was fire and thunder and lightning, a dramatic element in the way that he preached the gospel. Uh, Alan Stibbs was a West Country Englishman, like myself, with the uh, uh, a more phlegmatic temperament, but he had, a, he had a strong mind and a warm heart, and there was a tremendous compelling force about the way that he set out the truths of the gospel. Um, even though his, his voice was rarely raised, but it, it quivered because of the intensity of his own feeling, and you got that. Uh, since the getting the benefit of those two men half a century ago, uh, I have always maintained that the preacher is 50% of the message. Because the preacher needs to appear as a person operating under the power of the message that he is declaring to others. And I suppose one of the reasons why I'm so clear and strong on that is that I saw it as reality in Martin Lloyd-Jones and Alan Stibbs. There have been others, but less influential, and they'd be people you don't know, so let's... here's the story. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones and I, he as chairman and I as secretary, used to run a conference, full title, the Puritan and Reformed Studies Conference, and it was for ministers and Christian workers 
who wanted to explore the wealth of Puritan wisdom for use in their own ministry. Lloyd-Jones was um, old-fashioned in some ways. Whether he was right or wrong in these matters, I'm not going to decide. I just tell you he was old-fashioned. And one of the old-fashioned features of his thinking was that meetings for ministers were meetings for men. He believed that women had a ministry, but the heart of that ministry was to keep the men preaching. And um, he wasn't pleased at this particular uh, Puritan Studies Conference when he saw a couple of young women in the assembly. And when he and I were talking towards the end of the conference, um, he, he, he took it on him to complain to me about the fact that they were there. And he said, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't come for the Puritans, they just come for the men. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, having uh, got engaged to one of them the previous evening, was able to... <laughs> was able to say to him, uh, well, doctor, as a matter of fact, I'm going to marry one of them. And he, without batting an eyelid, came back with, you see it then? I was right about one of them. Now, what about the other? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call repartee. <laughs> Lloyd-Jones out of the pulpit where he didn't uh, crack jokes um, and that was, a matter of, uh, that was a matter of principle, was one of the wittiest men I've ever run across. Mm. And that, that was just a vintage example of Lloyd-Jones in repartee. Well, you've had your laugh. Now I suppose we're meant to get serious Back again. Back to the theology. Right? Okay. <clears throat> if you are interested in knowing more about Lloyd-Jones, we certainly have some of his books on the bookstall. We have a biography <laughs> of him by Ian Murray, who we had here in May. And we also have an audio and a videotape of an interview like this we did with Elizabeth Catherwood, his daughter who uh, has, um, I think, some of his same traits of personality. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Jim, let me read you a quote from a Baptist minister here in the district. Not too long ago. He's not present. Don't worry. And I won't name him. And tell me what you think of this quote. Okay? Yes, sir. Here we go. The church will always have its right, middle, and left wings of thought. The pre-post and all-millennial groups, the Arminians and Calvinists, the hierarchical, charismatic, and democratic ideas of church government, the inerrant, authoritarian, and inspirational views of the Bible, etc. None of us has all the truth. And when you add together what all of us know about God, it is still inadequate because he is incomprehensible. The gentleman's uh, comments about uh, what we are likely always to have in the church are likely to be true, and it's bad news. The gentleman's assumption that there's no way of deciding between these different views, and that that's why we have to keep them uh, going alongside each other, is, I think, mistaken. The gentleman's supposition that we can't adequately know God just because he is so much greater than we are, is positively perverse. Uh, I, I, you must allow me to use that Please strong do. word, yeah, perverse, because <coughs> God has spoken, used language, told us things, given us his infallible book, through which we may know his mind up to the point that he's revealed, up to the, all the distance he's revealed, we may know his mind absolutely. Calvin, I think, had the uh, illustration that fits here. He said, imagine, um, well, he didn't say it this way, imagine a person with a brain like Einstein talking to his two-year-old. He talks something like baby talk. He brings everything down to the level of simple childish speech that his two-year-old can understand. There's a great deal in the mind of the uh, speaker which he doesn't even try to tell his two-year-old because the two-year-old couldn't understand it if he got going on it. 
that's a picture of how it is with us and our God. But a good father with a brain like Einstein will talk to his two-year-old in a way that makes possible a, well, which actually brings about a very solid love relationship, trust relationship, genuine fellowship between the little lad and his dad, or the little gal and her dad. And that too is part of the illustration. God has spoken, he's told us as much as we can grasp, as much as we need to, as much, and as much as we need to grasp for a thoroughly fulfilling love and trust and hope relationship with himself. Himself there really is plural. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The truth about God is that he is they and they are he. And you have to use grammar like that to show that you're taking the, the Trinity seriously. But yes, um, the relationship with God is one of love and trust and hope and it's a solid relationship, and it's a fulfilling relationship, and it's a joyful relationship, but it's not a relationship in which we know everything about God. To say we can't decide between different theological positions because we don't know everything about God is, however, perverse, because God has decided in Scripture between those different positions. And it's our business to discern as best we can, seeking the help of God's Spirit um, to enable us to understand the Word for the purpose, to decide as, um, as, clear, as best we can, as clearly as we can, between the various options, embrace what we find the Bible really teaches, and um, let go other views. Certainly, while we're all of us doing that, we must be patient and tolerant uh, in dealing with people who are on the same task, but at the moment, anyway, coming to different conclusions. So I'm not suggesting that we should proceed against people who disagree with us on these matters as if they were heretics. But I do think it vital that we should hold to the fact that there is such a thing as revealed truth, and under God, it's coherent and clear. And if there are problems in grasping it, the problems are in us, not in Scripture. And what we need to do is to be more humble, more open, to listen more carefully to what others are saying, and to pray more earnestly for the light of the Spirit. Basically, I'm not on that gentleman's wavelength, though I appreciate his sincerity. Uh, and you can see what wavelength I am on, and I think I can fairly say that if the gentleman in the chair on my right were John Calvin, instead of Mark Dever, he would be nodding his head. This is pure Calvin. Are you nodding your head, Mark? Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, Jim, a, a frequent slogan, or a slogan that's frequently used in World Council of Churches circles, is doctrine divides, ministry unites. I'm sure you've heard that before. Indeed I have. Doctrine divides, mm -hmm. ministry unites. Now, just to bring up the ECT process, since we're all here, mm -hmm. um, uh, you and I have talked about the ECT thing a number of times, mm -hmm. and just to be clear with the audience gathered here, we, we, uh, I think we agree about justification, we disagree over the ECT process. Uh, I understand what you said that you're attempting to do, you're not speaking for others who are involved in it, but, but you're, just, what you're attempting mm -hmm. to do in being involved with the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document is trying to prepare, uh, or, or trying to get as far as you can in being able, if I can use this phrase, to be in ministry together even though you do disagree doctrinally. Now, is that unfair? It's not unfair provided you explain the formula correctly. The ministry which I would like to see Catholics and evangelicals engaging in jointly is evangelistic ministry in which the church questions that divide us are not directly raised. And the focus is entirely on the need of us sinners and Christ 
as the Savior who meets the needs of all humanity. And I would like to see us further able to guide converts, whatever their background, along a path of receiving ministry of the word, food for their souls, and enjoying fellowship with the saints for their encouragement and growth, and again, not have the church questions that divide us coming into the picture while that primary nurture is being given. The church questions, of course, can't be kept out of the picture forever. But I wish that um, we could go further together in primary evangelism. And I think that the cause of Christ all around the world would be strengthened if we could. And, and no. Jim, mm -hmm. at that, that point, I know that I know from having read things you've written on this before and talking mm -hmm. to you about it before, mm -hmm. it's a thing that for evangelicals like myself who don't uh, don't think this is going to be a fruitful process, uh, it it takes a bit of our listening to understand, let alone agree, but even to understand what it is you're trying to do. So let me encourage you uh, during the question time. Let's not turn this into an ECT referendum because for many people here, they don't even know what that is. But Jim, could you just tell us a few things that you've written? Because I know you're asked about this all the time, and you've written about this. Could you suggest some things we could read to better understand what it is you're trying to do in that process? Because I know you've written two or three things, but people might not know about those. It, um, in the book, um, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, um, published by Word in 1994 or five, I suppose, there's a long essay by me responding to the criticisms of the ECT process that have come from various evangelical Protestant sources and saying why I still believe that the project is worth working with. That, I think, is what folks should read. Uh, if you finally decide that as far as you are concerned uh, in your ministry and your life, this isn't something that is going to help. This isn't something that is going to further evangelism and nurture, but perhaps in your situation, make it more difficult. Well, you won't lose my respect if you uh, withdraw from the situation, if you express non-support, if you say, well, I think that the problems are greater than the benefits could ever be, or something like that. And there are people who take that line. I happen to disagree. So I continue. I just ask for the understanding as to why I'm doing this, for as much goodwill as uh, you can muster, and for prayer that God's will may be done in this whole process. If indeed it would create more problems than it's solved, should the venture succeed, should it be possible to build a platform on which uh, Catholics and evangelicals can preach the gospel together and do primary nurture together, well then, I would want it to fail. If, on the other hand, as I think at the moment, um, it would further the gospel for this project to succeed, well, I shall go on working with it, and I, for one, shall go on praying for God's blessing on it. All I ask for, I say it again, is sympathetic understanding of why some of us are laboring in this department and prayer that God's will may be done. I want to turn now to probably the reason most of the people here tonight are here, and it's some of the books that you've written mm -hmm. over the years. I mean, these are just some of the books that Jim has written. There are others we could have brought but uh, just to pick out a few that I've seen again and again have a large effect in people's lives. Here we go. Um, oh, I can't get this one because I'm the comment. Oh, well. Um, Jim, you want to comment on any of these? These early ones, fundamentalism in the Word of God, evangelism in the sovereignty of God, and then, of course, the one that made you the evangelical superstar you are, knowing God. <laughs> I don't know what sort of comment you expect after a remark like that. <laughs> there they are. It was Jack Horner who said, what a good boy am I. I'm not proposing to echo his words. But I, I will say, to the praise of God, 
that though I started writing these books fairly early in life, at a, well, just before I was 30 was when I was drafting Fundamentalism and the Word of God, I have, in, in God's mercy, I say it again, been enabled, like Calvin, to focus right from the start beliefs which I haven't had to change as the years have gone by. I hope that I've learned something over the years. I hope that the basis on which these beliefs are set has broadened. I hope my understanding of what's gone on and is going on at the moment in the world of Christian thought has been extended. But fundamentally, I am still where I was, and I'm prepared to go bail for anything said in any of these three books or any of, the, in any of those 30 books. Um, now, e even in Knowing God, you must get comments all the time about that comment. Do you know what I'm going hmm. to ask about? I expect so. The images. Yes. You must get questions all the time about that. Are you really saying that if we have a church bulletin, we shouldn't have a Rembrandt of, of the crucifixion on the front of it? No, I'm not quite saying that. Uh, what I'm saying, as I make clear in uh, a footnote added for the uh, 20 the 20 year yeah, it's edition, it's yeah. okay, new edition of Knowing God. What I'm saying is that um, we've got to remember if we're going to use um, images, pictures, uh, sketches, paintings, sculptures, um, which in any way purport to represent Christ, we've got to remember that there's a difference between representational and symbolic art. If you think that the paintings, drawings, sculptures, Rembrandts, or whatever, are actually intended to tell you what Jesus looked like, then you're better off without them. On the other hand, there's a long tradition in Christendom of symbolic, not representational, but symbolic art, art uh, exhibiting Jesus in a way which is intended to project truth about him and convey to you a reminder of his dignity as uh, Lord of all, enthroned by the Father. I'm thinking there, as maybe you've already picked up from my language, of the, ic the icon painting tradition in the Eastern Orthodox world. And uh, in modern times, iconic art representing Jesus in terms of the male ideal of particular societies has become quite a thing in world Christendom. Uh, in Japan, for instance, uh, Jesus is depicted by artists as an ideal Japanese male. And in black Africa, Jesus is depicted by black artists as a perfect black man. Well, what's being projected is the thought of perfection, human perfection. Uh, and it's, only, it's, it's not representational, it's only symbolic. I can see that for people who can handle that sort of thing, there's no harm in it, and indeed there's good in it. I still think that there are so many people around who can't handle that sort of thing, and will, if they see a Rembrandt, suppose that Jesus looked like the figure that Rembrandt paints, or if they see an Eastern Orthodox icon, which of course you can do in any, any Orthodox church, they will think that, Jesus is, that, that, that the icon is saying Jesus looks like that. There are so many people who, I say, will take all um, artistic images in, in a representational way, that on balance, the way of wisdom is to get on without any of the pictures. But where the pictures are, I'm not going to quarrel uh, when once I uh, have verified that they're being understood representationally. Mm -hmm. Sorry, they're not being understood representationally. Do you see what I mean? Uh, that, that's, now, that's an extension of the line of thought that, uh, that, that, that I set out in the first edition of Knowing God, 
uh, or it's a qualification of it, if you like, because in the original edition, I didn't distinguish between representational and symbolic art. And I should have done. But that, I see, is me broadening the basis of my own understanding of things. And I'm grateful to God for way, many ways in which he's broadened the basis without changing the substance. Why did you write a book about God? Mm. Oh, it was originally put together, uh, or rather, the chapters were originally composed, not put together, but composed separately for a little journal called the Evangelical Magazine that no longer exists. It came out every second month, and I wrote five articles a year for the magazine, and the editress, lady editor, is to be credited, I suppose, with um, producing the book, really, because she asked me, would you write articles on God for an intelligent reader who has no technical knowledge of theology, but who has a sharp mind, doesn't appreciate uh, vague verbiage, wants to be told quite precisely what there is for him to face in Christian teaching, and is prepared to be honest if you talk to him in an, if you write for, for, for him or her in an honest way. One of the keys to successful writing is to know your ideal reader. Uh, this lady editor had given me the profile of my ideal reader, and I wrote article by article addressing that ideal reader. Uh, the first question I asked myself was, well, where do I start with this person? And I started with, what's the first chapter of the book? Studying God is worthwhile. There's gain in knowing him, and that involves knowing about him. And then I went on from one thing to another. And after five years of doing this, I began to think, well, maybe this material could be published as a book. And I thought in, uh, in the, at that time that uh, it was a book that would have one edition, because the way that I had written was a good deal more thoughtful and therefore demanding of thought on, in my readers than was the case with most of the, the devotional reading at that time. I mean, the devotional reading that was being put in print at that time. So I imagined it would go through one edition and there'd be some people who were really serious in their study who would buy the book and then it would go out of print and uh, on we'd go to next business. And I'm still flabbergasted, really, at the way in which God has taken the book, sent it all around the world, put it into two dozen different languages, and established it as a nurture book for the whole evangelical constituency everywhere. Mm. That, that is what has happened. To God's praise, be it said, um, I am just very thankful that he's chosen to use something that I produced in that way. Mm. And the book does good still, 20, what, 26 years after it was first published. And I still get letters from people telling me what good it's done them. And I can only say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Mm. Amen. That's the story. Mm. Jim, one of the, you, you've, you've had more books that have continued to come out, but one of them that you and I talked about particularly is this A Grief Sanctified, Passing Through Grief mm. to Peace and Joy. Could you tell us about that one for just a moment? Yeah. <clears throat> First thing to tell you is that it's published by Servant Books, an interesting public ha pub what talk about interesting publishing house that produces um, books for evangelicals and books for Roman Catholics, both. The heart of this book, A Grief Sanctified, is the memoir which Richard Baxter, my Puritan mentor... Here he is right here, earlier. Jim. We asked him to come mm -hmm. this evening. Okay, well, those of you with very sharp sight can see him there, and the rest of you can imagine what, he's, what he looks like. Um, he lost his wife, and within a month of losing her, he had written out a memoir of her 
it was his way, really, of coping with his own grief. Um, those who have to counsel the bereaved nowadays know that sometimes you help a person by saying, well, write out your memories of the person you've lost. And then read what you've written and thank God for the good that there was, the good that there was for you in their lives. It's a way of appreciation coupled with um, the act which is so basic when you lose a, someone you loved, the deliberate letting of that person go. Well, Baxter didn't know all the um, ins and outs of modern grief counseling theory, but his instinct was to do exactly that, and he did it. And his memoir of the lady, um, a highly strung, temperamental lady, she couldn't ever have been an easy lady to live with, um, but a lady who loved him and whom he loved, uh, so that they had a very rich marriage together, even though they had to work at it. This, this, this memoir is just a lovely tribute. And when I first read it, oh, 40 year, more than 40 years ago, um, I wanted uh, to share it with other people, and I've wanted, from that, wanted to do that from that day to this, and I'm very glad that I had the opportunity. I edited it for the modern reader. I made it a little easier by um, cutting out some of the 17th century English, which um, would have stumbled some people. And I preceded the memoir with uh, an essay on Puritan ideals in marriage, which I think that the modern world urgently needs. And I followed the memoir with um, another chapter on grief, grief counseling, and actually coping with the pain and the distress of bereavement. I started with Baxter. I compared him with uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, at certain points, I said Baxter handled bereavement, on paper at any rate, better than C.S. Lewis did, and I believe that's true. And um, there you have two essays from Packer, which I think say things, illustrating them, you see, from the memoir, uh, that are very urgently needed in pastoral ministry and Christian life today. So this book is something of a favorite of mine. It's been out for a couple of years now. Um, I don't expect it will last long, but uh, I mean, it isn't becoming a seller in the way that um, Knowing God did. But I still think that uh, there's precious stuff here. And so, since you've given me the opportunity to do a commercial on it, I shamelessly do the commercial, and you've heard it now, and tell you this is a favorite book of mine, which um, has in it things that I've reread already several times uh, during the last two years and expect to read again. Uh, Baxter does wonderfully well, and I think that what... Uh, I say, and my studies subsidiary to Baxter uh, is, um, well, it's saying things that the world need, and, the, and the church needs to hear. Jim, we've just seen recently two volumes of your collected shorter works have come out. Mm -hmm. Is there to be a third? Yes, and a fourth. And a fourth. And do we know when those are coming? Well, the English publisher who's produced the first two wanted to get three and four out before the end of this year. He's got all the material, and perhaps he will. There's going to be an American edition of all four, oh. but uh, that hasn't materialized yet for the first two. That's good. It's, it's Can an I turn back now? Yes, you may. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks. It's an accurate book, at least on the cover of it. Mm -hmm. um, can, is it wrong of me to ask you in public what you think of the biography of yourself? Well, of course, it's a comic question. Uh, people are not supposed to have their biographies written until they're dead. That's to start with. And in my own belief, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and um, there are things that I know about myself that Alistair McGrath never picked up. Uh, <laughs> So that with half of my um, rather odd mind, when I find my, when I read the, when I read the, bi the biography, 
Um, there comes to mind a little poem that uh, I learned in England many years ago when I was about that high, I suppose. The other day, upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. Um, see, there is a sense in which McGrath's Packer isn't the man who's here. Though everything that he says about Pecker is, I think, factually accurate. But you remember what I read in, uh, in those, uh, the, the, that opening extract from John Owen, a half-truth treated as the whole truth quickly becomes a whole falsehood. I'm not quite sure that you'll get the full flavor, the proper flavor of Pecker from the group McGrath biography, although, as I say, all the facts are correct. Um, I can remember the bus ride from Oxford to Cambridge, where I was traveling with Alistair McGrath. I hardly knew him, actually, when we started, but we were sitting together and talking about many things. And after we'd been together for about two hours, um, he looked at me with uh, a very fixed, stern, purposeful expression on his face um, and said, out of the blue, just like this, I must write your life. I said, well, if that's what you want to do, get on with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I said I would check his facts and um, answer any questions he wanted to ask me. And so I did. And as I say, it's, it's an accurate book, and I am grateful to him for putting before the public a lot of facts about Pecker, which people don't know, and which I'm glad that now they can know. Uh, I've been involved in various uh, controversies and um, situations of what people have seen as ambiguity, though they've all been situations in which I knew what I was doing. People haven't always understood what I've been up to. And uh, Alistair explains me from that standpoint very well. I think it's fair to say that he wrote the biography selecting his material in terms of his own interests. So he projects me as a pioneer, something like a pioneer, in the reawakening of evangelical theology. If that really is the truth, I'm thankful. Uh, I can think of nothing that uh, I would have people remember about Pecker. Uh, that's more important than that fact. And he himself, you see, is a man who is very concerned to reinvigorate evangelical theology. And I think, really, he's, he's, uh, he was quite deliberate in projecting me as a sort of, um, what do you call it, a sort of patriarch or grandfather of that project, which he comes along now to take further than Packer was able to do. Jim As I say, it's well written, it's uh, all accurate, but that's how I feel about it. It's very much a public biography, and um, I, who know a little bit about myself from the inside, notice that some of the things that are there inside don't get mentioned. Mm. But don't think I'm rubbishing the book. I, As, as I say, I, I, I think the facts are accurate, I'm glad that it exists, he, of course, gets the royalties and not myself. It's, <laughs> <coughs> what, I, what I'm saying is entirely altruistic, therefore. You, I'm just trying to answer your question. I appreciate that. Okay.